Mayor Pallone is in here. We hope he's healthy. He's coming. He's on his way in. We just left something. He's on the way is, is he? He's on the way in. Oh, oh good. And here is, uh, I need you both, Dr. Wood. Okay, we, uh, we were worried maybe, I know the heat. Good. Why don't we start, with, uh, thank you, any, all of you. Mario, good to see you. Todo bien? Auguri. Uh, there was something. Thank you to the poets, and uh, we're glad John is all right. And we look forward to uh, his little boy reading. He's quite a, a writer. Dr. Paul Newell wants to read a poem. He wants to start the whole thing. Yay! Yeah. Let's keep it to about five minutes each, okay? Will do. Okay, thank you. Okay. I, I want to express my thanks to the Poet Laureate of the City of Long Branch for inviting me. Uh, I do not claim to be a poet, okay? Those of you who know me from Ron's realize I'm not a poet. But uh, uh, Emmanuel asked me to, to present something so I did my best. He told me the theme. He said, it's 4th of July. Oh, that's pretty good. And he said, also, we're here on the beachfront. So it's the sea, the ocean. Here's my effort, OK? And I'm trying to combine those two themes. Think about it. Oh, say, can you see the sea? Mother Ocean washes our sands with dancing waves from foreign lands. How they come here we hardly know. And when they wash our shores, where do they go? Maybe you know. Tides rise and then they fall, but our lovely shore is not a wall, and we welcome the sea change that renews us all. The spirit of that deep and dark living, heaving, sighing, sometimes howling, a la Sandy, thing, as we walk upon its border sands, brings back to life our inner ancient being. So we ask ourselves, why do we come here to this edge of the land? What do we seek? What do we need from the waters and the sand? And the higher power answers always. The sea does refresh your soul, and its waves cleanse our minds and make us whole. And so today, we celebrate our land from sea to shining sea. And yes, we can see the sea. <laughs> and of course, we are grateful to John and Kevin for putting this together. It's going to be on YouTube as usual. It'll be fine. Antonio Johnson. Antonio, where are you? He's one of the crew, the filming crew, and he read for us last year. Hello. Sorry, I was, uh, this is kind of a last minute performance, uh, impromptu. Uh, wasn't aware of the theme but there was something um, that I've been mulling over for um, a couple of weeks um, that uh, I decided to um, uh, manifest into something a lot bigger. Uh, it, it doesn't rhyme, it's not really a poem, it's more of just a, a thought, something that's been, you know, like I said, weighing kind of heavy on my heart. And uh, here it goes. We're taught when life gives us lemons, to make lemonade. But what we aren't taught is that not all lemonade are sweetened equal. You see, some people are blessed with a wonderful life of hope, love, and privilege. Lots of sweet memories and pleasant dreams. Life rarely throws lemons at them. So the ingredients for their lemonade lacks the sufficient amount of lemons to make lemonade. Maybe that's the recipe for a 
slightly flavored water. Some people lack the sweet things in life, necessary to offset the amount of lemons they've been pelted with. Lemons from society, from their place of work, place of worship, and even family and friends. So what makes the perfect lemonade? Empathy. Picking up the lemons that at someone else's feet because their hands are already filled with their lemons and baggage. To add them to yours, to give yours a little bit more character. Helping those in need to make their lemonade a little bit more sweeter. Life gives us all lemons, but not all lemonade are sweet and equal. Thank you. Our local Walt Whitman, Frank Valentino. Frankie. Frankie. Or is he uh, Edgar Lee Masters? I'm not sure. Whitman. We'll find that. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. I appreciate it. Uh, my family had a store here in Long Branch for 80 years. Uh, and my dad was a musician. My newest book's entitled uh, Three Tunes and a Vibe, which was the name of his band that he had for 60 years, 70 years playing in the area. Our first our poem was entitled Blue Jersey Night. Open windows with no screens and the feeling of loneliness climbs in like a thief in the night. The band is playing the last set of the show for the summertime crowd downstairs of the beachfront bar. She walked out and as the door closed like an unread book slams shut whose pages have yet to be turned. All that remains is her scent floating in the breeze of the ceiling fan's warm, salty air of the ocean out beyond the wood of the Long Branch boardwalk. Music in the air fills the room with a blue cloud as the singer's voice croons like a dream but cuts like a dull knife slicing through the heart. If the singer only knew that words of a song can wound worse than a blade, he wouldn't sing those love songs on such a lonely, lonely night. She's gone. That's a Blue Jersey night. Thank you. Um, the next poem's entitled Sinatra in Long Branch. Um, walking down the board, walking along the beach. Okay, it's called Sinatra in Long Branch, 2013. Walking along the beach at dawn, searching for sea glass as water washes up then rolls back like a stage curtain going up and down the man walking with a dog is wearing headphones and a yellow t-shirt with the words i turned 95 printed upon it he smiles removes his headphones and tells me that listening to frank sinatra takes him back to being a young man again which is a great way to start the day he tells me that Frank Sinatra met his wife on the beach in Long Branch when they were teenagers, when they were both vacationing down here in the summer. Counting off the years, I count 95, a long way back to 1918. And I wonder if fate is blowing in the mist off the waves, knowing that my father was born the same year, 1918. But his days on earth ended back in 1989. And I think, summer wind, come fly with me, that's life, night and day, all the way, the best is yet to come, and I think that's a great way to start the day. Thank you. And now uh, one more poem real quick. Um, uh, again, as I said, my family owned a food store in Long Branch. Um, John's family was there often. The mayor's family, I'm sure a lot of the locals here remember that. It. it was on Prospect Street. And being growing up in a corner food market, there's so many cast of characters that come in and out of your building on a daily basis. It's the best education any child could get growing up in a corner store. And this is entitled, uh, Pay Next Week for Food. Too little too late, the Ford heads out of Atlantic City in cold night as Dion and the Belmonts play from the radio. He looks into the cracked rearview mirror as bright lights of Atlantic City fade away like a, like a child's kaleidoscope at dusk. The eyes reflect in nightmares even though we can no longer sleep. 
Eyes of man, not of snake dice, are haunting when the 25% weekly vid is due to the fat man from Brooklyn who smiled like a cat when the Jets went down 21 nothing, and whose horse won at Mammoth with 30 to 1 odds. Luck turned cold and his last hundred bucks lasted two spins at the roulette wheel and the, and the click of the ball sounded like a blade of a guillotine as it dropped on black. This man is walking the plank off the ship of fools and the chance of survival is thin as ice upon salt marsh mud of Jersey swamps in winter. Cold air blows through broken heater core as his bald tires hum like hornets in his head. Thank God for Valentino's Market back in Long Branch. The family got food yesterday, but the kids still need new clothes and his loving, beautiful wife really believes that everything is going to be all right. Thank you, Mr. Valentino. Thanks, Larry. Run. I see a, a cutlery uh, imagery in your poems. On and up, yeah. Mine have a lot of birds. <laughs> I'm getting scared here. We're honored, of course, to have all of you, and especially honored to have our mayor, John Pallone. <laughs> Yay, this beautiful family. And uh, John, will you say a welcome word, Rita? We, we can take seven minutes each. There aren't that many poets today. Okay. Good to see you, John. Good morning. This is great. I see so many of you who we've seen here over the years, and uh, Councilwoman Bastelli, a former Councilwoman Bastelli, and Mario Vieira, and Councilwoman. Anita Vogt, Councilman Vieira, and Councilman Bill Bangler is here as well. Um, I'm just really um, honored to be here with you today because Emmanuel had this idea, what was it, three years ago, Emmanuel? Four years ago, to do a poetry festival here. And he first spoke with, with uh, Joy Bastelli and myself and, uh, and the mayor. And I'm just so happy that we were able to help with getting this all together and it's a great day and thank you all for being here. I'm going to read a short poem from Emmanuel's book, The Ocean's Will. And it's entitled, Once You Set Out to Sea. Once you set out to sea, stay the course. Head for the open waters, even if the winds shout the sails into shreds. Even if the mast is swallowed by flying serpents, stay the course. Head for the open waters, even if the sandbars and rock strips part of the ship's body, stay the course. Head for the open waters, the blue. Thank you. Have a great day. Joya Bastelli, I hadn't seen you. It's so sweet to see you. And uh, John Thomas? <laughs> Igor John. Along the boardwalk. As I walk along the boardwalk, I see people walking. I hear the waves crashing. I feel the wind blowing against my face. As I walk along the boardwalk, people, they walk past me. They ride past me in their cars, their bikes, their skateboards. As I walk along the boardwalk, I look at the beach, people relaxing, laughing, sunbathing, reading on this warm summer day. I look at the ocean, people swimming, floating, playing, putting their feet in the water, enjoying this afternoon as I walk along the boardwalk. Dr. Anita Wood, 
Consulate. Do you want to? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to keep with the theme of our wonderful boardwalk and celebrate both the history and the future of Long Branch with two poems from Emmanuel's book. This is on the resurgence of Long Branch's boardwalk. Women, men, hard hats using their hands, their sturdy shoulders, riding machines like gods. Unearthed broken rocks, cracked wood of ancient pylons, settled the earth down with powerful dirt. Cement with the steadying force of lava, supreme rocks, volcanic driven, and now the boardwalk knows its strength. Steel, tungsten, sturdy wood fused with ties mercurial. The light poles begin to rise, warriors bringing a good, the, the good flame light. Bushes spread out on the sand at the edge of the street and all is ready for the city's rebirth. And uh, Emmanuel's other poem is entitled In Praise of Long Branch. In Long Branch, the boardwalk rises. A rainbow of salt spray and spinning waves of seagulls flight. And plaintive sandpipers quick run. Praise the rebirth in word, in laughter, and in song. That, that first poem kind of prophesized uh, what ha what's happening at West End, right? It, doesn't it? Yeah, with the Dennis Sherman. Dennis Sherman, work. Why is it doing this? You know, okay, but thanks to Dennis Sherman's work. I remember it got published in the the Link, and I brought a copy to the one of the w women workers. You know, she was wearing a little hard hat right by by Seaview, and I, w I showed it to her. She said, you read it. So she called a bunch of the workers, and then I was reading a little poem to them. It was a wonderful thing. So I think uh, we'll go on with the Greg Glory, AKA Brown. Keeping with the theme, this uh, poem is about the Sex Pistols. The Sex Pistols! Famous rock band from long ago. It's about Sid Vicious after his girlfriend died, tragically. And he goes and he has a, a concert afterward and he gets into a taxi and then he talks to himself. It's a monologue. Sid Vicious talking to himself after the death of his girlfriend. Scene. Sid in a taxi going home after Max's Kansas City gig. Taxi is surrounded by rabid fans. Driver says, Boy, that Max's Kansas City sure is some wild joint, mister. I can't believe how many kids is beating the windows at my cab. Sid, shut your bleeding hole, old man. The driver, you youngsters, you're so rude. Sid whams the divider shut between the passenger and the driver. And then when he's alone, he uh, has this monologue. Alone at last, insensible and languid as any milky tear, I'll watch a wash in silence. These blank solemnities and joyless vigors strut their little glittering while before me, prating, I am life, I am alive, alive. Has not a salamander's tail disjointed from a sleek head and fidgeting in a hard palm like threads of fire, as much claim to life upon grounds of self-animation as these fans around me who clamor ecstasies? A quiet nun or contemplative Quaker staring walls down in a church command the vibrant meditations in a breath unbreathed. Voiceless and without even so much as an eyelid's unconscious stir that might annoy a flea, 
the devotee whirls the cosmos round themselves like a cloak invisible and the kneeling stars and choir warm their hush contemplation heaven's lightning stilled to comfort the dreamers central calm and so to cut short the fanboys whining yip and defoliate the greedy wreath of death before it's planted blackly ribboned above my Nancy's unuttering grave and to avoid the choked yodeling condolences almost worse than the ch shrive chastisement of my sense of dolorous crowds of mourners stamping passports of my private grief for a photo op of morning stardom I'll pack myself into a mourning cloister I'll eschew the tasteless ornaments of this world and revile in silence the thousand hands excited to touch or anxious to please holding nothing but their wanting of me I'll discard this thin sensuality of flesh poor in variety lost in having and in saving spent whereby we each mock ourselves in choosing one above another exiled from all their aping adulation and saved in being lost found in being saved I'll quit this exchange of jibes this commerce this weary commerce of weak weary souls primping worn attitudes in new attire I'll withdraw as does the widowed spider to her pall mourning gorged defeat inflicted damaged in spirit and in sense maligned grim in prayer to the godless absolutes nature's cheating majesty I cannot cease with us and that way I shall pay love to my departed love drive on driver drive on <laughs> It's straight out of Shakespeare, ain't it? <laughs> Why don't you write a play? <laughs> Honest to God. The greatest, the finest congressman in the history of Congress. And benefactor of us sure, Frank Malone. <laughs> we can wait if you're not ready. <laughs> what is this? Has anybody I, read My Daughter and the Seagulls? No. Thank you, Emmanuel. I'm reading from Emmanuel's The Ocean's Will, which most of you probably know, but I brought my daughter Celeste here today, so the title of the poem is My Daughter and the Seagulls. I'm actually reading it for the first time, though, so here it goes. I, of course, had noticed them on my occasional jogs behind the garbage dump and well-lit tennis courts, masses of feathers burning black into decay, but the feel of death can frighten me into silence. It took my daughter one look to say, so many seagulls have died this year. Perhaps they run into trees at twilight, or perhaps they're hurt by rocks or bullets from hunters. I notice the small dissolving bones and the feathers moving mechanically to any windless and less now, and watch the hot bodied seagulls, slim monuments of blood, and think of my daughter, birds and child both singing in the free air, both close to sun and clouds. I like that. <laughs> Great voice, Frank. I love your voice. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Talk about Shakespeare. Here's Dr. Daniel Zimmerman. <laughs> There's some really fine points here. Dr. Weeks, Dr. Zimmerman, Gary. Uh, Go glory brown you know and they kind of humble me come back you hear me okay yeah. okay uh, geography demanding nothing more than to possess its shore ocean chews the sandy cud of continents of islands it might entirely devour 
but for the deeper sea of magma welling up through boiling flues and roiling lava vents to drive it hissing back vassal of mastering winds and grooved subaqueous clefts and mounds asserting earth's ascendancy prolific or devouring promontory or recove maximum over mean still seaborne sublunary we walk awry like water and ours poetica the muses return from their exile, creatures moving through the trees. One will devour us, one will revile us, one will tickle us silly. We will find it useful to resemble trees until they pass. Then we can write poems on their backs of various colors, tattoos of which they remain oblivious, seen only by those who overtake them, like the beautiful, strategically clad and studiously nonchalant woman in the supermarket with a long verse in minuscule Sanskrit when we repeatedly excused ourselves in different aisles, zeroing in on the same preserves, as if neither knew or needed to the gist or etymology of her inscription. Enough, enough she might have known herself as its wordless translation. And that goddess in particular she who lives in the center, vertical as a tree, through whose leaves sun bestows her colors, rescues sky from clouds, clouds from sky, whose footprints defy tracking through such woods as offer bows to bend, to send fire-fletched arrows to vanquish foes, eager for wars to end, who dispel despair to a memory, who quell philosophy with an errant hair who makes good with a half sigh all anyone hoped to enjoy or ever could, the trickle of sand that relentlessly flows through an hourglass nobody knows how to take from her hand. Thank you. I have a cousin in Sicily, he's a great painter, his name is Franco Cilia, C-I-L-I-A. You can check him out on uh, Facebook. And uh, he sent me his latest, which is a very tall lighthouse in the ocean. And he said, what do you think this means, Emmanuel? And I said, I think it's a, it's a light sign to the ancient gods of Greece and Sicily so they can keep an eye on us. Uh, just happened yesterday, you know, the wondrous world of literature and art. It's an amazing thing. The legendary shore poet, Frank Finale. Thanks, Emmanuel. Good to be here and alive. start with. This is called Osprey. High in sky an osprey hovers. Quick dives for fish. Hits the water. Feet first with talons spread. Its aim true. It emerges. Fish firm in claws. With two great beats of its broad wings. Ospreys aloft. Beads of bay water fly off fish and wink in the sun. Less than two minutes, show's over. Osprey off to its stick nest, where mom keeps a sharp yellow eye on her chicks, which my friend spent two hours every day on the cam, waiting for them to hatch as though they were her own. Yeah, two more. Uh, time in a moment. All times contract into one. Clothes and cars come and go with fashions. Each spring bees and ants continue their slow work. 
All keys to doors I know change. I'm left only the skeleton key to my mind. Clocks and watches lose their hands. I stare into leaves on the elm tree outside my window, each with its own you and movement until I see essence of leaf. All birds warble this one timeless song. At night, under a star-filled sky, I forget the year and place, remember only a white flame which flickers through the stars in my heart. Thank you. Thank you. And this last one I read last year, but since it's such a beachy piece, that I'd bring it again. It's Notes from the Jersey Shore. Uh, it starts out with the ending of the letter, kind of. And it's part prose, part poetry. With love, the Jersey Shore. I've known you since before you were born. From my Sandy Hook to my Cape May, your moms and dads came to my fine quartz beach beaches to swim my waters. Their bright squares and blooming umbrellas decorated my Junes, Julys, and Augusts. At the end of the <coughs> each day, they met under my summer stars to kiss and create you, another one of my beach buddies, another fan who swears I'm the best place to go this summer. Your beach buddy toes in the sand. I came back to you, sought something I thought I had lost. Days under your sun spent with a pail and shovel, building wet sand castles. Mom peered over my oil-shined shoulders. The salty smell of your air and noise of your waves encompassed me. A sand gritty blowny sandwich, moistened with ketchup, sustained me. Except for a mind wave of memories that wash over me, those days are gone. I have weathered your stormy moods and suffered a love-broken heart and more. Still, I return to your shores. For what? I cannot retrieve what is lost. Yet, the voice of your waters and sameness of your elements soothe me. I come back to see the grace of your gulls, and by your heron priestly shores, I search for a shell that tells the story of my life. Forever yours, the Jersey Shore. Take whatever you can find on these sands. I have remade them. The dunes, the driftwood, the glass, the bones, the iron bolts of forgotten ships. Make of them what you will. Shape them into your life. Life <clears throat> as the winds have shaped me and create a new self. Be inspired. Praise whatever can be praised and visit me often. Thank you. Jenny Brown. Jenny Brown. AKA Storm. I know. Thank you. Um, this first one is in honor of my grandfather. Um, he's from South America, Santiago, Chile. And the two words you might not know in Spanish, um, terremoto, which is earthquake, and abuelo, which is grandfather. Gran Terremoto de Chile. In 1960, you weren't in Chile, Abuelo, when the earth opened up and swallowed your hometown during the most powerful earthquake ever recorded. What were you doing during those 10 minutes here in America? Were you showering off sweat after a long day running the racetrack kitchen, yelling out directions in Spanish to the line cooks about steaks and shrimp and tapioca pudding? Were you fishing off a pier at twilight, 
listening to a Spanish radio station and not really caring about catching anything? Were you eating your dinner alone at the dining room table, hearing your daughters giggle and squeal as someone got pinched putting on their pajamas? You weren't there when the water levels rose and the tsunami struck, when livestock broke fences and ran for the hills. You weren't there when landslides full of floating debris, including entire houses, destroyed the water supply. You were here, raising strong daughters, never teaching them to speak Spanish, because America was your country. Thank you. Um, this one is a play on the game that some people play as an icebreaker, which is um, three truths and a lie, and then you have to guess what lie the person is telling. This is called Three Lies and a Truth. Um, and I use a Russian word for tailor, which is portnoy. Three lies and a truth. I am a Russian tailor, portnoy. I needle, I stitch, I snip. My fingers bleed red for Russia, sewing cocoshing for women and girls, gold thread and pearls, a headdress to cover powerful hair to avoid misfortune. I am a fire eater. I open wide. I dip the torch. I don't inhale. My mouth burns for water, blisters for applause. Rule number one, don't touch your lips to the wire. Fire eating and love are stupid things, someone once said. I am a commercial diver. I submerge. I inspect. I weld. My arrow body in a rubber suit is cold and tender and dark and alone. I exit the water like I got stuff done with strong fingers on a handout to get paid because I am the art of manliness. And the truth? I am amused in love with a poet, a sonneteer, a troubadour, a tough fancy dude. I spin vines of honeyed fruits to throw overboard when he strays too far from home. Vines that snare him and lure him back to our domestic script, our domestic bliss. Thank you. My brother Matthew Spanner is here. I'm so happy. He used to be my student in 1885. <laughs> 19, 1985, right? And now he's my chairman uh, of the English department. The wonderful stuff. And he's a great poet and a great uh, editor. As is uh, back to Weeks and back to Zimmerman. I'm surrounded by genius. Come up, Matt. Thank you, Emmanuel. I like to write about animals. Um, animals act on instinct, and I think that we do too, quite often, maybe more often than we're prepared to admit. They represent a lot of the, the unconscious drives in us, and they, I think they really link outer nature and inner nature. Whenever we talk about poems, uh, about animals, I think uh, oftentimes we're talking about ourselves, or parts of ourselves. So the first one is, um, I fish a lot on the Delaware and Raritan Canal, which was dug out by Irish immigrants. And uh, that was almost, uh, it was in the 1800s, <laughs> 1830 to 1834. They worked in miserable conditions. Many of them were indentured servants. And they had to work through a cholera epidemic. Many of them died. They were buried in hasty, unmarked graves. So there's something about the stretch of the, the DNR Canal from Manville to Princeton that, that seems kind of haunted. It also happens to be one of the best places to fish for pickerel. So they're the little guys in the, uh, the pike family. So this is called Pickerel Grin. The pickerel I lured from the shrouded canal had the grin of a Murphy or a Houlihan, or maybe a McLuhan. Twisted smile of all who dug by hand the 66 miles. Their bleached bones dumped in an unmarked hole. Their souls leaching into the leaden current. Defiant underbite, lips drawn tight, exposing his jagged grin. The wild-eyed grimace that follows sharp despair when told of the dollar-a-day wage 
for toil in a self-dug grave. The cholera, shredded hands and feet, bloody rags for shoes, tattered fins that flail against the current, thinly veiled rage at having to stomach his terms to heed the starving screams of the suckling overseas. The hook set, he thrashes his chains against the bars of the net. I'll flay him and set free his watery ghost. Make of him a communion meal, raise a host. Eat of his flesh, drink sacred wine, and swallow the soul of all his suffering. So this one's based on a couple I observed uh, at an awards banquet. She wanted to be there, he clearly did not. And for some reason this popped in my head when, when we came upon a snapping turtle uh, out on a hike along the canal. It's called turtle soup. Made with alligator snapper, the appetizer opening the awards banquet. But its life force lingers still in the heavy brown broth. A molten spoonful draws me down the bowl swirling, mud hole, his cold blood slowly flooding the chambers of my heart. Something digs in against your admonishing glances, gazes up at your gossips like goslings that have strayed into dangerous waters, glares at your polite assembly, speeches sputtering on the surface, Platitudes plashing like fatigued frogs, teasing a hair-trigger spring. A trap loaded to snap up the whispers and quips that dart around the table like minnows, lured to my murky den with a twitch of worm tongue. I wait, an angler from the abyss. Lure me out at your peril. I'll not budge. My long-clawed gauntlets bore into bedrock beneath sand and silt where I lodge and seethe, an anvil in Vulcan's forge. Spiked tail protruding from heavy armor. Some dark magic must have merged in me black knight with black dragon. Wait me out? I'll winter six months plus without a breath. Gnawing on a grudge like Ugolino beneath Cocytus's stinking ice. Your thaw only stokes my appetite. And the eye of my vice looks to lock on a target. The fingers of your outstretched hand? For my steel beak to neatly cleave. Dispatch your envoys, signets paddling heedlessly, dangling their delicate feet over my dungeon. I'll snap them down one at a time, leaving just the snowflake down, dancing on the settling surface. So one more. This is based on a um, really strange event. I was at the bus stop with the kids one morning in April. It had rained the night before. There was a heavy mist. We heard something coming toward us out of the mist. We looked and it was an enormous coyote heading straight for us. I had nothing but an umbrella. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? At the last minute, it veers off and we see that its right forelimb is dangling. It had just been struck by a car. So, of course, had to write about this one. It's called Coyote Alone. Before Easter, it incarnates out of mangy morning smog lopes through manicured lawns, bolts across Main Street. Stuns rush hour traffic to a screeching standstill. Strikes smartphones dumb. All eyes on hunched hackles. Bleeding lips curled over gleaming canines. Bears down on children at the bus stop, frozen like lawn deer. Locks up their limbs. Loosens bladders. They await the sharp snap at the nape. The quick twist, the life dripping with the runoff down storm drains. Corners left at the last second down a side street through their backyards toward the river, perhaps to die. Runs fast on just three legs, right forelimb dangling, nearly severed by an SUV moments before. A roadrunner, or the roadrunner SUV. A roadrunner running late whose beep beep did not equate in the beast's apex brain. It saw a metal monster with hard arm armor, not fur, dead light eyes and grill work fangs that swallowed blacktop and spit gravel. It felt the black claws that grind bone and fur. Now relies on all his wiles.
to make it back alive to the den where wife and pups await a kill, lumbers limping through polished swing sets in the shadow of new McMansions. The children stand stunned by the quick change from beast to victim, the trickster tricked. A stumbling Steppenwolf, his near-severed limbs swinging like a pendulum through their nightmares. Thank you. I'm still learning from these kids. It's amazing. Our local historian, Charlie Bruns. Hey, Charlie. Thank you, Emmanuel. My poem was inspired by a story I read about baseball great Ted Williams. It didn't turn out as well for Williams and his family, but there's hope for many others. And I want to dedicate this morning's reading of it to my uncle, John Marquez. It's titled, Family, Family. Swish, swish, what goes on out there? Some yelling, some tears, much heartache. Ah, a boy, how cute, he looks just like me. More yelling, more tears, lots of heartache. Disappointment, embarrassment, shame. The boy goes out to sail. The winds blow east, they blow west. The clouds thicken, then pour rain. He can barely stand. The forces knock him down and he falls in the water. Drenched, he climbs back on board, naked, shivering, crying. Over and over, disappointment, embarrassment, shame, family. The boy grows into a man. He can withstand the wind. The rain bounces off his skin. He jumps into the water and climbs back onto the boat. He dries himself off slowly and looks up at the sun, eyes closed, heart open. Swish, swish, what goes on out there? Some lullabies, some smiles, some joy. Ah, a boy, how cute, he looks just like me. More lullabies, more smiles, lots of joy, satisfaction, confidence, pride. The man goes out to sail. He steers his boat calmly, deftly. Protected from a passing shower, he resumes his jo enjoying his time at sea. The sunset is beautiful and he admires the view of it. Back ashore, he looks forward to a restful, fulfilling evening. Over and over. Satisfaction, confidence, pride, family. Postscript. Mix some light tones into a dark color and a medium shade appears. Add a brighter tones into medium color and a lighter hue appears. Just like the family some people are born into, just like the family some people create for their loved ones. Thank you. We have two more poets. Back to Daniel Weeks. And then our local. Dr. Weeks is a great editor, a poet, and a hell of a critic. <laughs> he really is. Amazing stuff. Thanks, Emmanuel. I see that uh, the Colons and I are the only ones who took the memo on the blue plaid shirt seriously. Okay, sorry. Uh, I suppose you all know uh, Ron's West End Pub, and so uh, this is a kind of a new poem set in Ron's West End Pub, if you can imagine that. Put yourself there, you know. Early evening at Ron's. Greg takes a healthy pull of his blonde carton boat, the oar of ingenuity dipping in the weed-choked note to move a leaden dream. Time doesn't exist, Iman says, his voice a reverberating blondish oboe reed. It's made up. 
Suddenly his hand twirls above the carved up tabletop, fingertips together like a kid's striped top. See, it's just the duration of the earth spinning. The burn of whiskey mimics a conversion of motion to minutes and makes me think in rhyme, no time, no space as the globe of Iman's wine glass catches up an empurpled version of my face. I wince a little at the hint of double chin. I shrug, just another dustless hologram from the universal rim. Which is pink, by the way. They say it's brown, but it's pink, the universal rim. I've got one more uh, I'd like to do. Um, this is a a canto, canto number six, from a long poem about my original hometown, Wall Township. And I lived in uh, Long Branch for nine years, too. Um, and this is from my uh, collected poems, which just came out, available on Amazon, shameless plug. <laughs> and um, on July 14th, which is Bastille Day, uh, we're celebrating at the Red Bank Public Library, 1130. Uh, I'm going to read things from this and explain a few things and play a recording of uh, some of the poems that can't be read by mortal man. And this is a taste of that. So Canto the Sixth. Uh, Daniel Dennett, by the way, is referenced in the poem, but just by his last name. So. We must rectify the soul. What can it be to us, the semi-godless, locked in our endless possibilities, too many choices and no truth? Dennett disbelieves the soul, leaving a shucked oyster, like the calcified bones of the cloistered church, all echo among stone vaulting and window glass. Disbelieves, though the word stands for something, as the hollow skull the earth casts up testifies to its use. The brain's battle car, its ancient helmet, soul suffers, lies unattested still. Two little thoughts strip the body down to a dung mound. I wonder if, say, world gathering Michael Clough, my cup so mat like in his fisted mind, modeled now with names, could these constitute a soul? Much have I traveled in the realms of gold. Our Father who art in heaven, we hold these truths to be. Or does soul run out like cold water between desperate fingers, slipping back into the black vacuous spaces between stars? Soul, emphatically, does not flit ghostly about without the body when the death rattle comes, or puff out of the mouth a Greek exhalation, but is simply, maybe simply the mind fixed on memory, for remembrance is the grain, an irritant sanding like red Christmas sugar the neural networks, the doughy brain and its shelly skull. A spur to intellectual beauty, this pain, gathering its stories, accreting shiny layers, experienced as a snowflake in descent, a burnished pearl shut in the dark of the self, a leer-like pearl onion too tough to wholly peel, yet partly shown, like invisible gas sealed in the jar of this palm, stoppered in black seraphs. So my hometown, Glendola, is parcel of this soul I sing, like Long Branch and Lexington, Keats and Coleridge, Frost, the moon over the slant-roofed barn, the waving cornstalks green in morning sun near Hurley Pond, where deer jump out onto the road from nowhere like some one thing forgotten, something rising swiftly again in the pool of the mind, steaming maple mapling the kitchen before the sun is up, my legs too short to reach the floor, my young mother a faceless presence beneath the greenish halo the circular tubed bulb casts. And all is gleaming, the bowl, spoon, and speckled tabletop, the steel silver legs of my chair, the chrome oven front, my polished shoes. It seems too bright a morning to lose to dawn, but I am ready for school. What then of forgetting? a help meet carving the fiction soul in stone. Relentless even after death ends the paltry sentence, this scythe cuts all down to a single stone revealed when the grass is mown. We swallow pearls like teeth and lie down in green even fields, tongueless, bruised, our skin parched parchment or soft white orchid petals, sweet dung come home, useful at last. Oh, vandals roaring in on Harleys will crack that stone, bust it back to grains to pepper wind. The grass overgrows again the dead, 
where bone ash sold for porcelain, we pray for wildflowers. The soul, the soul is in the poem. Amazing stuff, huh? Eh? Greg Glory wins the prize for best reader, so I'm gonna buy him lunch when this is over. Where are you, Greg? Right there. Yeah, one. We have a final reader, a, a walk-in, a local, George Eckhart. Just out of nowhere. Here you are, George. Good morning. Can you hear me? Good. Okay. Um, I have the poem American Enterprise over the auction block. Um, if I were to um, offer this $10 bill, um, is there somebody who would give me a dollar for it? It's a real $10 bill. I got, I got a dollar over there. $2. Anybody? Two. Two. Two, nobody give me $2 for $2? $2? $2. Three. I'll give you 20. <laughs> I, I, never knew, I never knew if that worked. Going once, going twice, what's the going price? You'd rather sell, you'd rather not, whatever the feeling, whatever the lot. It's going once, going twice, going over the auction block. A Tiffany lamp. A jeweler's gem, a railroad tie, or whatever else was left inside. It's yours for the having, yours for the having. That's American enterprise. It's something small, it's something grand. A bang piano or a hat rack stand. It could be fixed, it could be old, it could be junked. It's evaluated, described, and sold. Bring your wares, empty your chest, clean the attic and invest. Who owns it now? It's not so steep. You could be next. It's going cheap. Going once, going twice. What's the going price? You'd rather sell, you'd rather not. Whatever the feeling, whatever the lot. It's going once, going twice, going over the auction block. What can you afford is not important as getting the object before the bell tolls. Who owns the most when said, said, sold? That's American enterprise. Who's the bidder? I'd make a bet. It wouldn't go for more. It couldn't go for less. There's excitement here. A gambler's thrill. Whatever happens is happening still. It's going fast. It's going nice. To a little lady or the dealer's wife. Going once, going twice, what's the going price? You'd rather sell, you'd rather not. Whatever the feeling, whatever the lot. It's going once, going twice, going over the auction block. It's the county fair the barnyard tail, the boardwalk hype, or the city air. Whatever the occasion, it's an auction type. It's always there. And what's the proof? The price is going, 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 going through the roof. It's getting late. The rules now change. We're interested in nothing. There'll be no exchange. Going once, going twice, going thrice, now half the price. Bid lively, please, the hour nears. His tone is fading. He can hardly hear the worn-out auctioneer. And he echoes once. He echoes twice. He'll fall asleep with bed bugs and mice. And for the last time, going once, going twice, what's the going price? You'd rather sell, you'd rather not. Whatever the feeling, whatever the lot. It's going once, going twice, going over the auction block. He raises his arm with all his might. See you next time. Safe home. Good night. Sold. Thank you. Thank you. A friend of mine feels the need to read a few lines from the Declaration of Independence. Eh, and then we'll meet there, some of us, okay? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Emmanuel, and thanks to you all. This is always a beautiful celebration of Long Branch 
And I heard this document read in its entirety uh, this morning on the radio. Sorry? Oh, well, I'll get to that. <laughs> and um, I had forgotten how moving it is. So I wanted to just share the first two sections. My name is Linda Johnston Mulhausen, and uh, I co um, co sponsor the River Reed reading series in Red Bank, which is Dan Weeks on July 14th, and Greg Glory is my co host. Anyway, this is the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America from July 4th, 1776. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the, clause, the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. Laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. And it goes on from there. <laughs> Thank you. I love the Declaration of Independence, but it took those guys 200 years to consider women part of the whole thing. <laughs> kind of hysterical, ain't it? Yeah. I love you all. See you next year. <laughs>